Clifton. I'm uh, the director of the O'Neill Institute on National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University. Um, we apologize for being late. We had technical problems, but welcome to Facebook Live, um, co-hosted by the O'Neill Institute, uh, Georgetown University Law Center, the Georgetown Global Health Initiative, and uh, the Harvard um, Global Health Institute. Uh, I'm joined by a you know, very dear friend and a global thought leader, Ashish Jha. Um, Ashish is a uh, professor at uh, Harvard University, both the School of Public Health and the School of Medicine. Um, he's uh, been uh, really uh, the leading voice uh, in almost all of the epidemics. He convened uh, the a major um, Harvard London School of Hygiene um, commission uh, uh, after the um, uh, West African Ebola uh, epidemic, uh, and now is taking a leading uh, role in thinking about how the nation and the world can deal with COVID. So I'm going to start by asking um, Dr. Ja a question, um, and then, uh, and he will reflect on the global situation. I will then come back to the United States and look at what powers the president and governors have and what is effective and what is not, what is constitutional and what is not. So let's begin. Um, Ashish, can you just give us a uh, um, an overview of where we are with uh, the COVID pandemic uh, as we speak today? Great, Larry, thank you for having me on. And it's a pleasure to do this partnership with the O'Neill Institute in Georgetown. Um, we have a long tradition of Harvard Georgetown partnerships on these issues and, and I'm hoping it continues. Um, so let me take five minutes, Larry, and just kind of bring everybody up to speed on the state of the pandemic as of April 3rd at 2.15 p.m. Eastern time. Um, it's a rapidly changing pandemic. But we're, I, as I see it, we're probably about four and a half, five months into this pandemic. We think the disease outbreak began sometime early to mid-November in Wuhan. Of course, the world became aware of it on December 31st, and, and it was really early January uh, that we identified this as a coronavirus, uh, sequenced its genome, developed a diagnostic test. And the, the disease, which started in China, um, was initially seen as just a Chinese um, infection, though, of course, all the data suggested, uh, even by mid to late January, that the disease had spread across a large chunk of the world. Uh, China, as you know, has become very mobile since 2003 when the SARS outbreak happened. Uh, China is a very different country 17 years later. And, and I think most of us believe that by the end of January, the virus was out to cross a large chunk of the world. If you think about the epicenter of the disease, it moved from China to in some ways East Asia, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, ultimately Japan. Um, though all those countries did a very good job of controlling it. All took slightly different approaches, but have managed it without uh, massive numbers of deaths. The epicenter then moved to Western Europe. Um, we saw it first really in very large numbers in Italy, um, but what followed in Spain, uh, France, Austria, uh, Switzerland, Germany, uh, UK. UK is very interesting in how it is. Initially, I thought it was really on the ball, and then it took this very weird turn for about three weeks, and then it did a U-turn again. And so the UK is going to be an unusual story. And then really in the last two weeks, the epicenter of the disease has been the United States. And as of this afternoon, we're at about a million fifty uh, in terms of number of cases of one million fifty thousand, and the U.S. represents about a quarter of all those cases. Um, and the way I see this is that the epicenter of the disease will remain Western Europe and North America for some time, for the next several weeks. Um, but of course, it's not sparing the rest of the world, and there are some very important issues happening in South Asia and India. Um, where the number of cases is low, but probably understated, and we have there's a national lockdown. Uh, the number of cases in Sub-Saharan Africa has been rising, and the number of cases in Latin America, and, and ultimately the epicenter will move uh, to these places with large populations where majority of the world lives. And the last point I'll make maybe um, before I, a um, couple more points maybe. One is that the countries that start where it started, China and then the other East Asian countries, they're not done. Right? They have had one phase where they were able to bring it under control. But the disease doesn't end until we have a vaccine or until so many people, such a large proportion of the population has gotten infected. 
that we have herd immunity. And so those countries like the rest of the world will continue battling this pandemic until such time. And I suspect that's a 12 to 18 month time period. And right now, there are two strategies that we know that we have for curtailing this disease. Um, one is a very aggressive testing, isolation, tracing, quarantining strategy. And the second is substantial social distancing. And we think that the right combination is a mix of both that you need. <clears throat> but what we've seen in country after country is that they've taken a different approach and a different mix of the two. And, um, and that probably is right, but people have, a lot of countries have gotten it wrong and a lot of patients have ended up getting hurt and a lot of people have died because of it. Um, so we are still early in this pandemic, um, long way to go. Um, and the things that are, I think, bringing out hope are the hope for therapies, uh, the hope for science to move quickly on a vaccine, again, even under the best of circumstances, I think is 12 to 18 months. And a hope that we can create some sense of global solidarity because the only thing that we know about this virus is uh, that it respects no borders, it respects no um, traditional ideological fault lines and affects all of us uh, equally. And, and we're gonna beat it by working together across the globe. So maybe let me stop there with just a high level overview of I think where we are. Happy to dig in, happy to have, and I have questions for you, Larry. I know you're gonna ask me some questions, but we'll get to those. Um, but happy to go wherever you wanna go next. Okay, well, let me just reflect a little bit about what you said and then talk a little bit about what we're doing here in the United States and particularly yep. uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, how we're conducting social distancing and who has the powers to do that. Um, I thought your, your um, overview was, was spot on. It was absolutely um, uh, the right way to think about it. The combination, I think, of you know, contact tracing, testing, uh, isolation, quarantine, um, and physical distancing are, are, are indeed the two major strategies. Although I think that um, uh, in what, what happened in um, East Asia in particular um, was that they were able to use more of a containment approach. And the containment approach really was massive testing, um, a lot of use of um, surveillance, smartphone technology and other things to trace contacts, to make people aware if they were been exposed and then to isolate and quarantine. Um, that becomes much harder when you have masses, massive numbers of cases because it's just so hard to test everybody and to and to and and to contact trace. We just don't have the equipment. So it depends upon the phase that you're in. In, in. but of course we can't. We, we certainly can't give up on um, contact tracing and you know quarantines. Although it's becoming much more difficult in big epicenters like New York City. Um, where you know the, where, where they're really focusing on social distancing and triage, um, you know, in the health in the health system, and so one of the one of the big issues that we're you know thinking about is you know how do we mitigate it, um, and then how do we mitigate it in a way that preserves health system functioning. Um, so keeping with the global for a minute, I mean, I was um, talking with the head of um, uh, 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 the O'Neill Institute was talking with the head of the um, uh, African CDC. Um, the National Academy of Sciences has been working with the African Academy of Sciences. And so that could become one of the epicenters, as you said. Be, I think be, what we're looking at now is, is you know, the Middle East, you know, Iran, um, the Indian subcontinent with a massive population there. Um, and of course, you know, if it got into refugee camps, um, uh, into unstable countries like Syria, Yemen, it could be a, a worst case scenario. But Africa has had so much to deal with for such a long time. And usually Africa is first. Um, and now they're delayed. And so they're finding themselves in a real quandary. They, they're having to actually bid for testing kits and ventilators and things on the open market, they can't, they can't afford it. Um, so we have to have a strategy about how we can help globally. And 
I thought what you said at the end was exactly the right thing, which is, can we do this together as a global community? So far, the, the signs haven't been good because everybody is, is, is prompted to nationalism, populism, blaming the other. And so we need to stop that. So now let me just kind of look at um, more of the United States. Um, and so the United States uh, is, as you say, it's the current epicenter, although on a per capita basis, it probably doesn't have as many cases as say Italy or Spain, no. um, but it's still a massive number and it's likely to increase. Um, so we lost a lot of time with the strat your first strategy, Ashish, which is the you know, testing contact tracing because we didn't get our test kits out on time in, and we didn't have them of good quality. Um, we decided to go our own way rather than purchase them from allies like Germany um, or WHO approved test kits. Um, and so we, we lost you know, critical weeks, if not more than a month. Um, and so we, we almost jumped to mitigation, um, but there's a patchwork across the United States. Some countries are doing aggressive mitigation. Um, like New York or California. Um, others are, are late, like Florida just, just did it. Uh, and then others are doing absolutely nothing. In New Orleans, they're doing a lot of physical distancing, but nothing on the, in the outskirts of New Orleans. So that makes no sense. Um, and so uh, what are the powers we've got? I had an article in JAMA yesterday with Lindsay Wiley. And in that, we kind of look at what the president's powers are. The short answer is, and I won't go into detail, is that the president doesn't have power to shut things down or to open them up. Um, but he does have the bully pulpit. He can give political cover to states to do that. And he can fund it. So if, if the White House and CDC set really good guidelines um, and directives, but not mandatory ones for physical distancing, um, and then the president um, uh, reinforce that and we had massive um, uh, public health announcements saying why this is important. With that political cover, with the funding, I think we could achieve it. Um, so I'll just end by saying that, you know, America, uh, American exceptionalism, American federalism, we can be the best in the world and not so good. Um, so why don't I turn it back to you, Ashish. You can either reflect a little bit on where we are in the United States or we can then you know, pivot back globally or back and forth. Yeah, let me reflect a bit on the US and talk a little bit about federalism. You know, what's been really interesting is that federalism does have some silver linings, right? That for instance, uh, governor of Ohio, Republican moved much earlier than the president of the United States did on talking about social distancing and shutting down. And we had a bunch of governors who, who moved before the president. And so one of the upsides of federalism is that when the federal leadership uh, fails, you can have state-led leadership and, and that has value and that has meaning. And, it, and we're seeing some of the payoff in California and Washington state elsewhere. And New York. Um, and in New York. The problem is that uh, we are slowly turning this into a 50 state battle yeah. against the virus. That's exactly right. And a 50 state battle uh, means that Americans lose um, because when New York is competing against New Jersey and against Connecticut and against uh, Louisiana for equipment, um, it's a real problem. And uh, that's not the kind of market we want. Uh, a market of uh, state buyers. This is where court, federal coordination is critical. And um, so this has been to me the most disconcerting part of this is that the federal government has sort of taken an approach of, this is not on us. Uh, even yesterday when Jared Kushner um, said, you know, the federal, reserve, the federal stockpiles are not state stockpiles. Who else would they be for? I mean, most Americans live in a state, uh, it turns out. Um, and the federal government is supposed to be the, the coordinator, the backup, the supporter, the in them, you know, at, at, after 9-11, the, the federal government didn't say, President Bush didn't say, well, this was an attack on three states. I hope those guys, those three states sure know how to respond back. 
right? The president was very clear it was an attack on America and, and doesn't matter that the primary effects were in a few states, uh, you know, New York, Pennsylvania, and, and, and Virginia. Uh, the president was very clear that it was an American war. So uh, this is going to be a challenge for us. And we need to figure out a way for the country to come together that doesn't rely on the White House. And I don't have a good mechanism, um, but I'm guessing we're going to have to try to create one uh, because we really do need the states to work together. Um, I do want to, by the way, just say one quick thing for those who are listening uh, via Facebook Live, if you have questions uh, please go ahead and send them in because we will uh, happily intermittently take questions as we have. That's this right. Discussion. And that was my job to do and I didn't do it. So thank you. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> We're in this together, Larry. We're doing it together. Well, um, you, you're, you're um, a, a preeminent uh, physician in the United States and, um, and globally. So why don't we spend a few minutes on um, uh, the health system and health system scarcity? Um, I think we should talk about it both in the U.S. context, but also globally, because I'm becoming, you know, really worried about that, and particularly when a vaccine comes out, and whether we're going to equ equitably um, uh, take care of other countries, or just yeah. it's going to be, you know, the United States, Britain, Germany, Japan, um, hoarding all the vaccines. So I could see that happening, or many of the vaccines. Yeah and sidelining WHO, but let's start in the United States. I mean, we are, you know, you've heard all this uh, talk about bending the curve. It's kind of, it, it, it's interesting to see the kind of language that we've been using for years all of a sudden is in the popular discourse and everybody's a global health expert now. Yeah. Um, but uh, we're seeing uh, the, the idea of bending the curve isn't necessarily to save a lot of cases because the cases kind of drag on but it's to preserve health system functioning yeah. first and foremost. Yeah. Um, and so we don't want to overwhelm the health system. Um, we're seeing now, um, you know, heart wrenching um, uh, scenarios where doctors and nurses are becoming ill, some dying, um, that they're not getting the kind of rigorous um, uh, personal protective equipment that they not just that they need, but we owe the owe to them ethically. Um, and for patients, you know, there we've got a shortage of ventilators um, and other essential um, medical resources. Um, and so, one of the things we've been thinking about is, you know, first, how can you mitigate scarcity? So you mitigate scarcity um, in in one level by trying to not overwhelm the hospitals with cases, but you also can mitigate it by, you know, wartime like production of the kinds of um, equipment that we need so that we can actually not have such scarce um, supply and try to do so without price gouging and having states compete with one another and have countries, poor countries, um, compete with rich countries, which is, you know, unconscionable. Um, but even with all of that, we have to think about, you know, what are ethical triage criteria? You know, who, who gets priority? I've done, did a paper yesterday for the Hastings Center report, which basically goes through some of this. Um, obviously, I think first responders have an ethical priority. Uh, I think those who are um, most in need do, um, the vulnerable, um, the disadvantaged, the, the, the people who have been um, marginalized um, uh, at the health, in the health system for such a long time. But we're gonna have to think this through about how we um, do priorities. And then um, we're gonna also have to think through, you know, how do we help other countries when they're experiencing crushing um, uh, shortages? And particularly when effective treatments, as you mentioned, and then even more so effective vaccines come, just imagine how the globe would unravel in terms of its solidarity if we had most lives protected in Europe and the United States and high income countries like Japan and people were dying in the hundreds of thousands or the millions in, you know, in India uh, and um, uh, Latin America and particularly Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, I wonder, you know, as, you know, as a leading voice for health systems, you know, how do you, how do you think about these things? Yeah, it's a, 
bunch of really important issues and let me just maybe touch on a few of them. Um, so one of the questions I've been asked by probably a half a dozen journalists this week is, are we giving priority to COVID patients over non-COVID patients? Because mm. there's obviously plenty of uh, very sick people who rely on the healthcare system. And are we saying that it's okay for somebody to die of cardiovascular disease because uh, we're giving priority to somebody with COVID? And I think the answer to that is no. Of course. I don't think we can use the clinical condition as the, uh, the diagnosis as the triage criteria. It has totally to be agree. about mm-hmm. severity of illness. The most acute ill patients go first, whether that's a COVID patient or cardiovascular patient or a patient with cancer or anything else. But communicating that is very important because that's not how Americans are feeling. And a lot of very sick people with really serious medical conditions are feeling like they are getting uh, deprioritized and sidelined from the healthcare system. And that's a real problem. And we have to somehow manage that while we're managing, uh, managing the surge. Um, and, and I think the ethical issues around what happens when, if a week from now, as many people are predicting, we run out of ventilators or we have very, very few and many more patients in ventilators, what are the criteria we use if there are five people in the emergency department, all of them need a ventilator and there's two? Which two get it and which three don't? Because the, the, the three who don't will die and die very quickly. So, and the two who get it have a good shot of living or some shot of living. And so like, are we gonna make a priority list? Who's gonna make that priority list? And how much discretion are we gonna give doctors and nurses on the front lines? Mm-hmm. And I am sympathetic, not just because I'm a doctor, but I'm sympathetic to giving healthcare workers a priority because while everybody else is running away from COVID, doctors are running towards it and nurses are running towards it. And so saying to them, you'll come first makes some ethical sense. But beyond that, it gets really murky for me. Um, you know, do we, in Italy, they were making it ad hoc and they were doing it on age and saying, if you're 65, you're not going to get it. But if you're 55, you will. I have a real problem with that. Um, and they're doing it on, well, survivability is higher for a 55-year-old. I still really struggle with that. And almost any other criteria, I don't know what to do with. But it seems to me like we have to do some open conversation as a country about what are we gonna, what are we gonna live with? You know, I, it's interesting, I have not been as worried, and maybe I'm just being naive about this, Larry, and I'll be curious about your thoughts on this. I have not been as worried about if we develop a vaccine, will we get it to Indians and uh, Africans or not? And let me just at least make the case for why not. I mean, it's, it, it, one should be worried if you look at history as any guy, right? The, the long That's history. That's what I was looking at, yeah. Yeah, so, so you're like, so Ashish, have you just decided that the, war, the history no longer exists? And the answer is no, I haven't. Um, and of course, I'm still a little bit worried about that topic. But ultimately, I feel like this is such an unusual exception that the idea that the U.S. for So look, imagine that a company in Germany comes up with a vaccine that works really well. And um, you know, it's licensed in America, it's licensed in Europe, and production is cooking along. Yeah, Ch- India has quite a bit of capacity for India production does. of yeah. stuff. Do, does anybody think that America is going to try to invoke through World Trade Organization and mm-hmm. other means intellectual property to prevent India from making the vaccine or therapies? Not in a pandemic. No. And so that's my hope of like, it, it, countries are just going to make it. And they're going to say intellectual property be damned, and we will deal with the political and economic fallout of those things later. And the political pressure to do anything otherwise will be unsustainable. And that's why I think we'll get a pretty rapid deployment. It may be that it comes to America and Germany and UK first, but within days to weeks, I hope and expect it'll go to the, and I look, I could easily be naive on this, but that's one place where I've been hopeful that all the rules will go out the window because of where we are. Yeah, um, so let me just reflect a little bit first about uh, the health system and then go to the vaccine part and then we may have some more questions that um, uh, we could answer. Um, you know, as, as you know from you know, our work on Ebola and other, uh, other epidemics, uh, during an epidemic, more people die of diseases other than the disease yeah. that we're fighting. Uh, and, and it could be from diabetes, cardiovascular disease, unsafe um, uh, birth delivery. Yep. Uh, and, and so 
you know, paying attention to that reality, I think is, you are absolutely right that, you know, we can't give preference to COVID patients. Um, I also have, you know, some difficulties with um, uh, age-related uh, allocations uh, as well. Uh, I think, you know, you can do it based upon um, whether or not the person is likely to, to, um, uh, to benefit from the treatment and how much. Um, the disability community, for example, is very uh, concerned about, you know, things like survivability or 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 what, yeah, a, life, or what, good a, life, reason. what a life is worth. Um, so, you know, on the vaccines, I wasn't thinking of the intellectual property. Of course, I'm a law professor. I should have been, um, but no, because I I just assumed that in a uh, in a global crisis that 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 you know wouldn't get in the way. I just assumed because you know the wh whether or not vaccines are hard to produce in mass quickly, um, and you know we don't have the technology that act to get it running, and even things like seasonal influenza occasionally we 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 have um, uh, manufacturing difficulties. So I was assuming scarcity, and with scarcity, um, I yeah. think uh, we will opt. And even President Obama, with all of his wonderful global intuitions, you know, had promised WHO a uh, share of H1N1 um, vaccine. Um, but when it became, when people in America were frightened, he pulled back and then when it turned out it was a fizzle, he gave it. And so I think, you know, uh, you know, populist uh, leaders today, I, wor I worry about that. Now, India has always been the lifeline, you know, in terms of generics and things like that. So I would, you know, so if yeah. India could step in, help with those vaccine productions, and if we didn't have scarcity um, and we could make these generically and, and affordably, uh, I would be comforted by that. Um, I just, you know, I, I guess it's my, the cynic in me. Um, no, you know, and look, and, and as you said, his, if history is any guide, we should absolutely be worried. And my saying I'm not super worried is not my saying I will not pay attention to this topic. We got to make sure it actually happens, that it is distributed equitably, gets out across the, the world uh, quickly. It is entirely possible that without paying attention, it won't happen. And we just got to make sure it happens. But I, I just said, I just, I, my gestalt is that, that this, this, of all the inequities that this virus is, is highlighting, and there are many, I'm hoping this is not one that we're going to get stuck on. There are a couple of questions. Should we take a look at them? We are. What is about wearing masks? Yeah. One is about wearing masks. And the second one is, was there ever a patient zero in the US? How did this virus spread from coast to coast so rapidly? So um, do you want to take either one of them? I'm happy to take one I mean, or both. You know, I mean, you know, either one of us could take either one of them because yeah. so why don't you just, you know, you, know, right. you, should, you go ahead. In Let fact, you can answer it, both yes. and then I'll just um, fill in. I think I know what you're going to say anyway, and it'll be right. I will. So I, I, <laughs> well, let me talk about patient zero idea, because at least, um, you know, this idea that there was a single patient, the first patient, and then that spread it. My sense, as I have looked at the data, New York Times has a gorgeous graphic on this. Um, but as I've looked at the data, I've looked at what Mark Lipschitz and, and others have talked about, Trevor uh, Bradford, um, is that there were multiple seedings of the U.S. from China. If we assume that it all began in Wuhan, travelers came. Um, we saw the early cases uh, outside of Seattle, uh, but I don't think it was, a, you know, it's possible that that area got seeded first and then people traveled to New York. It's also possible there were people from Europe who seeded uh, the East Coast. Um, this is the problem of living in a highly globalized world is that you're not, it's going to be very hard to find one case and then trace everybody else from that. There were multiple cases. It's also why things like travel bans are relatively ineffective uh, because you can have them and they can buy you a few days or maybe even a week or two, but they don't prevent the disease from, from taking hold and taking off unless you completely shut off the whole world and you do it very, 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 very early which is unrealistic and not doable. So that's why I've seen this so widespread across the entire country and, and no patient zero. Thoughts on masks, Larry? Well, I was- Or on the patient zero that, issue? I'll, I'll go to patient zero first and then I'll go to masks. Um, uh, you know, I think you're right. Um, I've said all along, you know, well before it happened, I said, 
we're, we're going to see um, COVID in the major coastal cities um, and also in Chicago. Why? Because those are the international hubs. Um, so you're going to see it out of, you know, um, Newark, JFK, um, uh, SFO, um, LAX, um, and Chicago. Um, and that's, of course, that's what happened. And it's, it's inconceivable that there was just one person that came over. Um, there have to be many on a plane. Um, and so I don't think that, that it's realistic to think of patient zero in, in that context. Maybe if we had uh, you know, really uh, picked it up after the Wuhan market, you know, species jump that, you know, we might have been able to find that, but even then it was hard. On masks, you know, I mean, you're the expert, but essentially, um, as we speak, um, the US CDC and the World Health Organization are um, strongly considering, and I suspect they will, to revise their, their guidelines. And basically, they're going to recommend more widespread use of them when you're in public spaces. Um, and, and as I understand the data, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you know, basically, um, uh, the, the idea, if you're well, that a mask will keep you safe from the virus is probably very, very low. Certainly not if you don't fit it right and you're not wearing an N95. But if you did it on a population basis, it could slightly mitigate spread from those who have it. And it also sends a, sing a signal to the population, hey, this is serious. It's a, it's a constant reminder. So I do expect to see CDC and WHO guidance change, you know, uh, within the next days or weeks. Hey, Larry, I know we're going to get to other questions, but I want to actually ask you another question, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I, I've been struggling with the topic, and I, I'm going to, I want to get your um, expert view on this. So the history of doctors, and we'll just shorthand doctors for other healthcare providers, but the history of doctors in pandemics is not a glorious one, meaning in, in for centuries in the middle of disease outbreaks, doctors would be among the first to run away. But in the last hundred years, things have changed. Our medical profession has really changed and the professionalism really requires, and we all assume, that our obligation is to take care of patients in the middle of pandemics. That's why I said, when everybody else is running away from COVID, doctors and nurses are running towards it. It's a beautiful analogy. And, 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 it's, and it's, a, it's, it's right. At least a few people have started asking the question, do doctors still have that ethical responsibility? If society is saying, you know what? We don't really care about you. We're not gonna equip you with the, with the materials you need. Um, we're not gonna prepare. And we want you to not just put your own life at risk, but we want to put the lives of your spouses and your children at risk. And not for a thing we couldn't have prevented or couldn't have foreseen, but because we have chosen to not prepare and we have chosen to not give you what you need. It's like asking firefighters, we want you to go into a burning building, but we have decided not to give you any equipment. And, but not only will you die, but your family is also going to be at risk. Does the ethical balance now shift where it becomes ethical for doctors to say, I'm not doing it. I'm not putting my family at risk and I'm not putting myself at risk because you society have chosen, chosen not to equip me with the equipment I need. What are your uh -huh. thoughts? You ask agonizingly hard uh, questions. Well, I'm struggling guess, with this, right? I've got this, you know, I've got the legal answer, but the ethical answer is really hard. Um, so what's the legal answer? Well, the legal answer is, is, is that if a, well, it's twofold. One, you know, there is a responsibility for, to make sure that you have occupational health and safety. Um, and so, so the hospital and the government are violating, you know, their legal obligation. I would argue also their ethical obligation. Um, on the other hand, you, you know, a doctor, if a doctor is um, or a nurse is um, in their contract to do certain things um, and they don't do it, you can discipline them or even fire them. But you can't go to their house and rip them from their family and bring them to the emergency department. Um, so, so that's the legal answer. I mean, 
let me start with an ethical cop out and then I'll try to uh, do a little bit better. I mean, the ethical cop out is, is that all ethics are um, relative and, re and reciprocal. And so the government and hospitals have that ethical obligation to protect you and you have an obligation um, to, to rescue it, that you, that's what you signed up for. So the question is, is if one of those parties violates the ethical, their ethical duty, does that free you from your ethical duty? My sense is no. Uh, my sense is, you know, you, know, you just, no. I, I don't know why, <laughs> but I would, say, I would say not. But I would say I would hold both to the kind of that high um, ethical standard. Okay, um, but I'm would, gonna push back, but we know that the government and therefore maybe through the government, the hospitals are not living up to their ethical duty. They're not providing. Yeah. Um, does, does a physician have an ethical duty to her or his family uh, mm -hmm. to not infect them or to unnecessarily and, and aren't they violating that? So we're, we're putting them in a dilemma, in a very difficult situation. Yeah. Uh, but is it, would you say that physician is unethical if that physician says, I'm not coming to work unless you provide me with an N95 mask uh, to take care of my patients? Um, no, I would never, I would never be so presumptuous as to say to somebody that's protecting themselves and their family, you're being selfish and unethical. But I still would encourage them to do it to the best of their ability. Okay. I mean, you know, suppose, you know, we're thinking of health workers, but think of um, a coal miner, you know, you, you, and you know, in West Virginia, this has happened, you know, you've got to go to work in an unsafe mine, um, and we're not going to protect you, which is what happened, and OSHA allowed it to happen. Yeah. Um, so these things are, are horrible. Now, we're getting a lot of questions. I wanted to yeah, pick, let's up, do, one pick of up a few more one of these questions, but because it, it coincides with the question I wanted to ask you, um, which is why is the UN not coordinating the global response to mitigate, et cetera, et cetera, the effect? Um, so the main UN agency here, of course, is the World Health Organization. And you, more than anyone else in the world, has thought about the role of WHO. And uh, so how do you think WHO has done in this, in terms of coordination, getting the world together, in its uh, in its dealings with China, you know, talk a little bit about that. I, you know, so I'm one of those rare people, I think, who thinks WHO has actually done a pretty good job. Um, so why do I say that? They've been transparent. They've been very open about communication. Um, if you want to knock WHO, it's always easy to knock WHO. You could knock them on the China issue and say, you weren't as tough with China. You've trusted China too much. You didn't take on China. And a part, of me, a part of me says, I don't know what it means to take on China. Yeah. China is a very powerful and important country. Do I think China has played this gloriously? No, they've hit information. They've done things that are really problematic. Um, I don't know, maybe in the ideal world, I would love WHO to have been a bit, call them out a bit more on that. Um, but I don't know that there is some mass cover up that WHO is enabling. Oh, I do think that. China has covered up information. Mm. Um, but I think overall WHO, given the, the remit it has, has done a pretty good job. It can't coordinate global supplies of PPEs. That's not within its remit. And, and member states won't allow it. America is not going to be like, oh, we only get this because WHO told us we only get that. No, right? The powerful countries aren't going to allow that. So I, I think given the constraints that we have put on WHO, I'm not sure that I could expect a lot more, maybe a little more, but I think they've done a pretty good job. What do you think? Um, I think you're, you're, they have been transparent. I, 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 I would have liked less effusive praise of China and I worry about those too. things. Um, but I think that's right. But I get the feeling, and, and it's not WHO's fault. It's because of the, you know, s this fierce return to sovereignty, nationalism, populism, that now that it's gone, when it started in China and WHO really didn't have a presence in China the way it did um, with West Africa, and then uh, going to other high-income countries in East, uh, Eastern um, Asia, and then Europe and the United States, 
it felt to me like WHO has been a little bit sidelined. I agree with that. Um, but so but not by its own fault. Right. No, I was saying not by its own fault. But I think we're being asked to take on more questions. Okay, which, let's do a couple more. So um, which one do you want to pick up on? How, about, how did experts not anticipate the U.S. faring as poorly as we are now? In addition, what can individuals do in the near term? How could this crisis influence proactive change in the future? What can leaders do? So I think what I would say is that most experts saw, saw this pandemic coming, uh, if not by end of January, certainly by early to mid-February. And a lot of people were sort of saying, we got to prepare, we got to prepare. And we fell into our traditional bubbles of, of some chunk of people thinking this is a big hoax and no worse than the flu. And, uh, and, and so we got ourselves caught up in traditional uh, problems that we have kind of all the divides that we have created in our country uh, that really, I think, prevented us from moving forward uh, for probably a month or so after it became very clear that we were going to be hit with a pretty large pandemic. Um, I think now, even though there's still some amount of political division, I think most people are starting to get on the same page about both where we are and what we need to do. And I think there's a lot of work ahead. If we are going to open up again as a country, we're going to uh, let people get back to work and get back to school and get back to a semblance of life, even if it's not a totally normal life. Um, there's a whole lot of work ahead of us. And, uh, and, and getting our healthcare system through this next phase, there's a lot of work ahead of us. And that's, I think, where um, we need to bring, come together as people. And I, I'm more confident than I think I have been in the past that we're not going to see as much of a red-blue divide on that. People across the political spectrum are realizing, even if political leaders are not, uh, that we are in this together and this is going to be a difficult uh, path. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, we've only got five more minutes, so let me take another, take another question. One but kind of pivot um, a little bit from it. Um, one questioner asks, you know, how can this crisis uh, influence proactive change in the future? And I've been thinking more and more about that, Ashish, in, just in terms of, you know, when we, and, and you and I have talked about a commission and, you know, thinking about it. So what are the lessons we're going to learn from yeah. it? Um, you know, I've, I'm, I'm, I, I had finished a book for Harvard University Press on, on global health security. Of course, I'm gonna to have to rewrite much of it. Um, uh, but the thesis of that book is, is that we kind of lurch from complacency to, to panic. And so will, will this you know, once in a century event shake us from that you know, horrible dynamic? Um, so, would, will we see in the future truly robust um, health system preparedness um, for you know, uh, uh, planning, uh, rapid detection, rapid response, international cooperation under the international health regulations? So that's one lesson we, we should learn, will we? I don't know. But the other is, is that this is, we've never seen anything like it. You know, human rights lawyers, public health lawyers, we have never, ever seen the kinds of measures that in terms of intrusive surveillance, lockdowns, mass quarantines. Um, and so will that be the lesson? Um, you know, it, will there be an enduring um, problem uh, with, uh, with, with human rights? Or will, as soon as something happens, we just lock everything down, shut the borders, um, rather than invest? And I hope we invest. Um, so we've got you know, three more minutes. Why don't you just either answer a question or just reflect for a couple of minutes um, um, as, we, uh, as we go off live. Yeah, so let me, there's one question about what is the estimate of when will we go back to nor near normal? Yeah, we all and get let that me question. play, use that as a way to say how, where I think the dividing line is and of where we go forward. So we are gonna get through the next three to six to weeks. So the question that people have been asking, so what are the trigger criteria for opening up again? How do we know whether we can open up? And broadly speaking, we're gonna to need to see substantially declining new cases. And verifiable. Uh, and verifiably so. Um, a, a very robust testing infrastructure that will allow us to verify how, much, how many cases we really yeah. have. And then a much better prepared health system that will be ready if there is a surge of cases. But when I talk about and think about opening, the opening up doesn't mean everything goes right back to normal. It will likely be staged, it'll likely be slow, we'll have to do a lot of monitoring along the way. 
And when I think about this summer, I think of the summer as, you know, maybe we'll be able to get on an airplane and go visit grandma somewhere, but we mean we will not be going to baseball games. I don't see 40,000 fans sitting together in a baseball stadium. I think that would be a disaster. Um, I, you know, maybe there will be beaches open, but there will be very substantial rules about how many people can go on the beach at a time and a lot of social distancing. And so we will be in a period of semi on, semi off. And if things go well into the fall and we get into the fall, there is going to be a very high risk of a very big resurgence. And we've got to spend the rest of the spring and summer preparing for that and getting through it because uh, if 1918 pandemic is any uh, measure, but other uh, reasons to also believe. And we're gonna have a this, what we have suffered now is gonna be this, but even more substantial in the fall. So I, I think we're in this for a while and we've got a lot of work ahead of us, um, but I think we have for vigilant and do the right things, we can get through it without losing a lot of lives or destroying our economy. And I'm up. I don't know why, but I'm strangely optimistic that we're going to figure this out and do it. Yeah, I mean, you're from Harvard. Time. I'm from Georgetown. One of the questions I would have asked, but we don't have time, is, you know, will the universities be back um, in running in classrooms and things? I think we're going to have to recalibrate that. We don't have time, so I'm being asked to uh, close it up. Um, I wanted to, you know, first and foremost, thank you, Ashish, um, for such a pleasure. Larry. Just such a thoughtful. Um, a reflective uh, view of where we are, but also more importantly, where we're headed and how we could change that trajectory. Um, I also um, love your spirit of hopefulness and, and mutual solidarity and that we're in it together. I think that's really the message that we want to leave um, all of our listeners. You know, this is not a time um, to be divided. This is a time when we need to really unite together, not just as Americans, but as an international and global community, so, you know, so support our public health uh, leaders and support the World Health Organization and others who are right in the middle of this. So thank you. Um, uh, you've been- uh, Thank you for partnering uh, with me on this. this yeah, so uh, on behalf of the Har Harvard Global Health Institute, the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law, um, Georgetown University and Georgetown Law Center. Um, we thank you very much for joining us and uh, we hope to do this again sometime. Um, so good afternoon to you all. Thank you and have a good, good day, everybody, and stay safe out there. Yeah. Bye, Larry. Bye, Ashish. <laughs>